So, Charlie, first question to you. Um, you know, a lot of places talked about being smart cities, and the benefits from them are sometimes a little hard to recognize. Um, there have been some pretty high-profile failures. As AI really develops, and we get this new technology, is the idea of the smart city now maybe coming into fruition? Thank you so much for having me today. And I think um, I'm really excited about the potential of AI primarily because it levels up the playing field. So for the longest time, smart city was uh, pitched as this you know, innovative, very, very effective way of governing cities, but it was afforded only by developed nations or developed cities, right? So the four processes to achieve a smart city, data collection, data analytics, decision making and action, um, for the longest time, the folks who can afford data collection was really developed cities like Singapore, many parts of China, uh, Korea. Today, data collection can be done at a fraction of the cost using AI for developing cities, right? So that makes it uh, bringing it forward in terms of leveling up the playing field for these cities. But I think to, uh, I also wanted to curb some of the enthusiasm, right? So mm -hmm. like if you think about data collection, that levels it up. Data analytics, great. You can now use some of the AI to do that. But let's talk about a little bit in the data decision making and action. Is that purely able to be done by AI? Uh, in this part of the region, I think we are still quite far uh, away from that because fundamentally, uh, cities are political. Mm -hmm. And there are political parts of the decision making that unfortunately, we don't trust AI. or I don't foresee that we trust AI to do that completely for us at this point. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to get back to this point about politics and trust. But before I do, I want to bring in Sean, you know, as someone who is doing this data collection. Could you tell us a bit more about Atrium Zoom AI and what you're trying to do? Right. So at Atrium Zoom AI, um, we see ourselves as the parameter of the built environment. So we provide intelligent insights and actionable outcomes uh, for property developers, Fortune 500 property management companies, and engineering consultants on the entire building condition assessments. Essentially, maximizing. Um, the life cycle value of these assets, right? So, so that's essentially like what we do. We work with uh, a myriad of data uh, sources, drones, off-the-shelf cameras, uh, and we ingest, ingest all these data sources to provide these outcomes in a very intuitive form. Um, and I want to bring in Joe now. You know, autonomous driving is another one of these terms that's been talked about for a long time. You're with GDU. Could you explain to us kind of what exactly is GDU and how it relates to Baidu, its AI initiatives with Ernie, and the Apollo robo-taxis. Where does GDU fit in this network? Yeah, uh, yeah thanks for having me. Uh, I think uh, uh, GDU, uh, first of all, GDU is a, uh, uh, we're kind of going to start up a company. We're only three years. Uh, yeah, um, so when we found it, um, we're aiming to actually developing what we call uh, smart EV. Uh, it's not EV, it's a smart EV, right? Um, so we call our product a uh, robocar. Um, so, um, so we have a joint uh, shareholders. One is Baidu, another is Geely. Um, the goal for them to come in together is, you know, for the past ten years, Baidu, ha ha, you know, Baidu has been like invested over hundred billion um, UIMB on AI technology. Um, so, so it's just right time right now for uh, for us to bring those AI technology you used to be run on the cloud. Now we can bring that to the cloud. So, so that's why uh, it brings us here, um, and, and, and I think it's the right time because the computing power on the car side and both on the computing side, on the car side, are, are uh, right now is big enough to supporting those AI to running. Uh, for example, um, AL4 used to be like, you know, uh, very heavy on computing, uh, on, on GPUs, and you don't, we don't have a, a vehicle level um, a chipset in order to run that on consumer um, you know, vehicles. Uh, not until 2000, uh, 2023, we have Orin X come from, you know, came from uh, uh, NVIDIA. So that's why we're doing that is uh, uh, we, 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 we develop cars and we integrate uh, bad AI technology like Orin board and, uh, you know, chat, chat like, you know, prog uh, AI um, uh, program and uh, uh, Apollo, uh, Apollo L4 uh, technology, but not exactly L4, but uh, how are we going to uh, firstly, um, you know, kind of downgrade the L4 and having customers to be able to use a high level, you know, kind of uh, uh, autonomous driving in the city. So that's the, the purpose and the goal of, of, of GDU. Yeah. All right. I want to stay on this politics point now. Yeah. Maybe first question to you, Charlie. Um, you know, I've, I've read some of your commentary on this and you, and you talk about things like 
housing, housing affordability, big political topic. I saw your LinkedIn post about diesel subsidies in Malaysia, another big political topic. How, are you, how do you see data analytics and AI and data collection interacting with the <coughs> political discussions in these cities, particularly in Asian cities? No, I think for the longest time, um, because data was so hard to collect mm -hmm. and things become a little bit more opaque, uh, it was very hard for uh, data-driven decision to enter into the conversation. I'm, t I'm saying enter the conversation because things are moving very quickly. The, by the time you collect this information, uh, it's too late, right? But today, things are so real time mm. that the conversations and the disparity between some decision making and the data uh, that's available becomes a little bit hard to reconcile. So I think uh, the availability of data gives a lot of transparency in mm. terms of what are, what are people really being motivated by, by doing certain decisions, right? So the, the diesel uh, point that I made on LinkedIn was that we are consciously thinking about uh, how we are building our city very far away. And uh, that in itself is a conscious decision on how much we are spending to transport our logistics. So while we are solving it with EV, while we are solving it with efficiency of AI, shouldn't we also use this to plan in the future and reduce that today? So those are the part of uh, using uh, the data collection using AI will help us bring that point forward to be part of the conversation, not really to dictate it, but at least participate in it. Is there also a risk that, you know, people can interpret the data how they wish in ways that support certain conclusions. I mean, what's the risk of people then misinterpreting that data and thus worsening the political debate over a certain issue? I think uh, that's always the case with any kind of data and mm -hmm. however you, um, you collect them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a lot of times people are really afraid of using data or AI to do in analytics because of biases, mm -hmm. right? But I think it is even worse if you don't have the data available for people to not be able to actually drill down to, tr to, to even question the data. Yeah. Data transparency is very, very important and the ab ability to allow uh, general folks to actually criticize that data, I think is step one. Um, I wanna go back to Sean now. You know, I remember when, when drones were kind of the next big thing in tech, you know, they were cheap, they were ubiquitous, they were everywhere, and then we all got distracted by something else. Um, you know, so two questions, you know, what else can drones help us do in terms of urban planning? And then how do you manage people's perception of those drones? They may worry about them being invasive, they may be worrying about personal privacy. So how do you chart that balance in terms of taking advantage of what drones can do, but also making sure urban populations aren't scared by fleets of drones collecting data on them? Right. So, so, th so that's actually a very good question. So, so obviously, um, I think there's a lot of fixation on drones as being like the next big thing, um, but obviously, you know, through sort of conversations with partners, customers, as well as industry um, um, stakeholders, um, at the end of the day, um, what the, the data right, that is being collected by drones, be it whether it's for construction, monitoring, uh, for asset inspection, for precision agriculture, um, what the industry and the customers really do care about are the insights, right? What are um, actionable outcomes and what can um, AI algorithms um, that have been developed, you know, how, how can they actually interpret some of this unstructured data, right? So, so I think the, 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 the perception definitely has changed over time. Um, and you know, from, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, being in, 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 in the business for like close to 10 years now, um, the sort of evolution of acquisition has also been extended to ground robotics, wall robotics, um, because, you know, the end client, uh, what they really value and care about are um, outcomes that would drive the decision-making processes, right? So I think in terms of governance around the data collection um, and security aspect. I mean, there are you know existing guardrails um, that um, that are in place, right? So obviously there are algorithms out there that could you know mask uh, faces, windows, um, you know number plates, etc., to sort of appease 
um, and uh, appease some of those like regulatory requirements. Uh, on the other hand, you know there are um, you know ISO standards um, that you know can be built right within um, the uh, the system level, right? In terms of um, data uh, encryption, sovereignty, etc. So there, there are definitely like best practices out there, right? So I mean, in short, um, I guess to drive home the point is. Um, you know the 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 end the end outcome um, of being able to interpret the unstructured data to drive the business decisions are the true sort of a testament of what the industry and the clients are actually looking out for. All right, right. Joe. One more politics question, then we'll move back to safer territory. <laughs> um, you know, so Apollo's robo taxis, yeah. investors have been very excited about those. But I know that's led to some controversy in Wuhan from people worried about uh, how they will affect jobs. And you know, how do you, how should cities manage that transition as more stuff gets automated? How do they manage the human labor that, that gets affected from that new technology? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, just just quickly answer this question. Um, it, it's still far. It's still you know too early to think about that, right? Because. Uh, um, you know, uh, Baidu has like started developing autonomous driving since 2013, right? Mm -hmm. um, like 11 years ago. So the government uh, under actually the uh, supervision of the government, mm -hmm. right? Um, so so you know started from a single vehicle, a few vehicles on uh, a single road, you know, all the way to now. You know, uh, just to be clear, not until last year, um, you know, um, 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 a, a, a fully uh, uh, L4 uh, robot taxi is not allowed in China to operate. In the government just uh, opened that up last year. <laughs> And, and, and really with a small scale, not a large scale, talk about Wuhan. Wuhan has over like 40,000 you know, taxi, mm -hmm. and, and, and the L4 robot taxi right now is only like 400, 500. Mm -hmm. It's very small uh, amount of, of robot taxi. I think it's still under trial. Yeah. And the government, it, it's, not a, it's not there, it, it's not like a, the next day they're gonna be like thousands of, hundreds of thousands of you know, robot taxi on the road, right? It's, it's, a, it's still you know, too early to, to worry about that, right? I mean, still, it's a, still a trial. And, 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 and most importantly, I think every time there's an evolution of a technology, it's gonna open a, another window up, right? So when you think about it, years ago, when we talk about you know, um, um, you know, those uh, robots on um, uh, car manufacturing lines, right? People thought like we're gonna lose, lose our jobs, right? But turns out there's more jobs that are created because those robots, when they, those, those robots come in and, and, and it's actually increased the, the efficiency of the manufacturing. And in, in, in that case, actually, it makes the, the sales of the car volume even bigger and it creates more jobs, right? So, so I don't think we have to really worry about so, that at this stage yet. Yeah, so automation will create more labor. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it yeah. ended up will create more, more jobs, yeah. You know, similarly on, on this labor point, I mean, um, by, by replacing, you know, data collection, sent, like people, you know, guys on the street with clickers, monitoring the traffic with sensors, um, yes, I mean, you will be, you'll be replacing jobs would normally go to people. How do you see that transition, again, also especially in most of Asia where, you know, labor is probably still cheaper than capital. You know, how do you kind of, again, balance between labor and technology? So I think uh, most of ASEAN is still thinking of the current situation, but uh, AI is going to be built for the next, you know, 50 years. It's not going to be for today. So if you are thinking of your population as the next, of course, everybody needs a job, but is it for the job today or the job for the next 30 years? Do you want to be a guy standing there doing the clicker mm -hmm. or the guy who's actually designing the AI system who's counting the cars? So governments are actually uh, in the position right now to make a call around the transitioning towards the higher value jobs in which you can actually create the value in the next 20, 30 years and not having to worry about stagnation, mm -hmm. right? So stagnation is something that we should worry about today. Mm -hmm. um, and taking the first step of actually uh, using AI as an augmented uh, you know, help for you to, to do that is going to be a, a good first step, I think. Um, Sean, I do want to bring in the sustainability point. You know, yeah. um, making cities more climate friendly. Obviously, we're in a region of the world that's going to be affected by climate change. How yeah. will these technologies make cities more sustainable? Right, so, so obviously, um, basically the built environment is kind of like the bedrock of uh, urban city centers. 
Um, obviously, you know, if you're using like robotics and you know drone platforms, etc., um, there are a lot of direct benefits um, in terms of replacement of having to like ferry workers on site, specifically in Southeast Asia, right? Because we still rely on a lot of uh, low-skill foreign workers um, that are, you know you know, essentially, you know, building the buildings and, and the city centers, like, from ground up, right? So, obviously, in terms of carbon emissions, there, there are, like, indirect impacts on transportation. That's one. Um, in terms of the data aspect of things, um, by being able to plug into various uh, data sources within building management systems, HVAC, um, there, there is a potential to also reduce the carbon emissions from buildings, right? So 30% of um, you know, carbon emissions today, um, you know, they come from buildings, right? So if we can uh, reduce sort of like the footprint um, in terms of how buildings function today through some of these insights, then it would you know, empower architects and designers of tomorrow to design more sustainable mm -hmm. buildings and assets, right? So, so that's how we, mm -hmm. you know, how, how I see you know, sustainability. All right. I want to squeeze in a couple more quick questions sure. for the time we've got. Joe, you were also previously, before GDU, you were the co-founder of MoBike, you know, yeah. the bike sharing app, sorry, bike, bike sharing service. What's a lesson from that experience mm -hmm. that you think applies in terms of data and urban planning? Yeah, we actually, um, so, so people just simply think, think MoBike is uh, um, bike sharing and we just dump bikes on the road without thinking <laughs> so most of the time, right? <laughs> and actually not, we're actually uh, utilizing a lot of data. Um, so um, we, we actually work with a lot of transportation um, research uh, organization in China. So what we're doing is we're actually using the bicycle riding hotspot, um, like map, home map, and, and combine that with bus and taxi and those like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, ride hiring, you know, see how these, th those three different type of transportation is gonna make up the whole transportation uh, system for the, for the city. Mm -hmm. So we actually help the government uh, to re replanning, replan their bus stations mm -hmm. because of the bike sharing, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes the last mile can be, can be covered by bike sharing. And we actually use those mm -hmm. data well, well it's, it's anonymous data, right? Um, uh, you know, work with, with government, like combine those three system, like uh, data from different systems and, and, and use that for urban, you know, kind of uh, planning, you know, to make people's like life in the city more easier, yeah. Super last word, Charlie. How much is this like the game SimCity? So like the game SimCity, when you interact with the city, yeah. there will be an effect, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the most of the time people forget the, the people protest too. Yeah. So I think if you remove, uh, if you increase taxes mm -hmm. and if you start monitoring everybody, um, there is a danger as well of pushing them too far and they start going onto the streets, right? So I think as much as we love uh, AI and data and data collection, we have to be wary that being in a city and being in an uh, urban setting, it is a political mm -hmm. uh, thing and uh, mm -hmm. decision makers mm -hmm. can use it to uh, assist in collection yeah. of data and the data analytics, but beyond that, mm -hmm. I think uh, we do have to be wary about it. Okay, that's the time we got. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers. Yeah.